So now I'm happy to introduce our keynote presenter, Dr. Robert Califf. Rob Califf is the Donald Fortin Professor of Cardiology and a Professor of Medicine in the Division of Cardiology at Duke University School of Medicine. He remains a practicing cardiologist and is an adjunct professor at Stanford University and is also serving as an advisor at Verily. Rob was the Commissioner of Food and Drugs for the FDA from 2016 to 2017, and prior to that, he was the Deputy Commissioner for Medical Products and Tobacco at FDA. A nationally and internationally recognized expert in cardiovascular medicine, health outcomes research, healthcare quality, and clinical research, Rob has led many landmark clinical trials and is one of the most frequently cited authors in biomedical science with more than 1,200 publications in the peer-reviewed literature. So you don't sleep very much, I see. He's led major initiatives aimed at improving methods and infrastructure for clinical research, including the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, a public-private partnership that was co-founded by both the FDA and Duke. Rob also served as the principal investigator for Duke's Clinical and Translational Science Award and the NIH Healthcare Systems Collaboratory uh, Coordinating Center. He's also the co-PI of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute Network. More information about Dr. Califf and his esteemed biography can be found in the conference guide. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rob. Thanks for that nice introduction. It's, it's hard to follow the musical uh, beginning and also to follow a Kentucky person. I don't know. Um, <laughs> something about Duke and Kentucky that has um, never quite made it. But we do have one thing in common that you'll probably agree on. We don't have to worry about Louisville this year. <laughs> so at any rate. Um, it, Thanks for uh, inviting me to be here. It actually worked out quite well. I'm living kind of a crazy life. If I sound confused, uh, half of my time is spent in North Carolina and the other half in California. And so this worked out perfectly. It's about halfway, not quite. And uh, it's a nice stop off as I accommodate to the time zones on my way to California. What I thought I'd talk about today, let's see, can we get the clock uh, started here? Because I want to make sure I stay within time. Good. Um, what I thought I would talk about today is uh, something that actually does have me confused, and I was um, really taken by Ada Sue's uh, words in many uh, ways, but one thing she said, we don't know where we're going. And if ever there was a time of not knowing where we're going, it's now. And I hope this talk will motivate some of you to get together and very actively define where we're going, because it's desperately needed right now, in my opinion. So if you sleep through the rest of this, these are the key points I want to make. Um, the healthcare system that we currently have, and I, I just went through an intense experience of a relative in the hospital, and I can assure you the system is not configured to optimize the health of the people it's aiming to serve. Anyone who does research in this arena is aware of this. In the face of the revolution occurring in information management, we really have a major deficit in generation of evidence about what works and what's best for individuals and for populations. Even when evidence is generated, we do a poor job of disseminating the knowledge and implementing strategies to deal with it. In addition to that, we now have this sudden avalanche of information related to the fact that we can begin to examine the other 99% of life, the part that doesn't occur in the clinic or the hospital. And I'll say more about the potential implications of this. So modern evidence generation, knowledge dissemination, and implementation can now be based on scalable systems if we have relatively free flow of information. These methods, I'm going to argue, can be used for tremendous good in a revolutionary sense. It can really make a difference in people's lives and health or cataclysmically for tremendous evil. And I think you all in Primer are in a position to help guide uh, which direction we go in. Another way of saying it is that my major concern right now, but also a major opportunity, is that gaps in reliable evidence and scientific truth will be filled in by misleading and false information. The same methods that could get reliable information to the right people at the right time can also be used to target susceptible individuals and groups for misleading and untruthful information. 
And this is happening today as we speak. As I was preparing the talk yesterday, up on my screen popped uh, a sort of a geeky article meant for the Googlers and uh, Amazon people about this issue that's going uh, on with uh, fake news and fake information. This is an actual Russian uh, ad that appeared on Facebook prior to the election. And I can assure you that the work behind this ad was not just somebody's guess. It was a result of deep interrogation using artificial intelligence to determine what would peak the greatest division among Americans going into the election, regardless of your political persuasion. And I would argue that we're seeing the same thing with regard to health care and people's health right now. People, uh, as I'll show you, go to Google search immediately after uh, seeing their doctors or nurse practitioners. The information they get comes from a variety of sources, uh, often in the absence of high quality information that's misleading and leading to uh, bad health. So I looked up uh, the mission of Primer just to make sure I had it right, and I would argue this societal issue, as it relates to health and health care, should be something that you're thinking about every day, because the only avenue to truthful, reliable information is research. In other spheres of life, we would simply call it learning, learning being based on the accumulation of knowledge and evidence in a way that uh, leads you uh, to the beacon of the truth. So the bottom line is that we live in a continuum of information, home, workplace, healthcare system. Learning is happening continuously with available information. And the old divisions that uh, I think form the basis for a lot of the thinking about the separation of research and clinical care are rapidly going away. So we need new constructs. And the one thing I can say for sure, having lived inside the federal government, is that the current approach to the common rule is simply totally inadequate and not fit for purpose. We have to do this differently because the system is not fit for the purpose of what's happening today. Now, my personal perspective on this is, first of all, that a lot of what I say could sound quite negative. So I do want to try to convince you that I'm actually an optimist. I feel like I've been really lucky. I came along uh, in the late 60s and 70s uh, when I started running a coronary care unit. We literally didn't know what caused heart attacks. Uh, people were dropping over dead in large numbers at young ages. And if you look at what's happened uh, during the course of my career, we've learned an amazing amount due to the hard work of many people like you that have guided the research enterprise, and we've applied that knowledge uh, resulting in a dramatic improvement in life expectancy and functionality of Americans and people around the world. But now we're entering a transformational period based on an explosion in, of information. And I think most people have not yet come to grips with the combination of cloud computing and the fact that processors around the world can be organized in a way that allows almost infinite computing to occur just in time regardless of where the computing is originated in the world, processors all over the world can be aligned, so there's not a limitation to the ability to compute. Now, it's been interesting to me as I live half-time in Silicon Valley and half-time in a major research university, a large proportion of my discussions in the research university are about the limitations of storage and computing. It never comes up in Silicon Valley. There's actually not a limitation, and it's only a short period of time until everyone experiences this advantage. So how do we get prepared for this? I, I, this is a list of things that we came up with at the end of the previous administration about what needed to change uh, as we come to grips with it. And you'll notice a lot of this has to do with the systems of doing research and curating knowledge. The personal mission, and I think the mission of many now, is uh, the view that people should have access to clear and understandable information about the benefits and risks, not only of products and medical interventions, but also major decisions about their health. And I'll say more about what this means. I call it asymptotic because, of course, we'll never get to the point of totally clear information. Real lesson for me was in the FDA. Try writing a food label 
that has to be intelligible to 320 million people at different levels of education and speaking different languages. You'll never get it right, but we can do a lot better than we're currently doing. The great thing now is that there is absolutely no technological limitation to developing clear, understandable information about the benefits and risks of medical products and decisions that we make. All the limitations now are cultural. And I think you all are among the uh, leading stewards of our societal approach to how we deal with the opportunity and the risk that comes with this explosion in information. Now, I'm going to go through some pictures that are, that are a little bit depressing, because I think the need is absolutely urgent. And I hope that at this meeting, um, there will be a lot of attention paid to things that need to be done to move the learning system along as quickly as it possibly can. So first, the good news. And I always feel like I have to show this slide. I show it over and over. Um, up until now, we've had a continuous reduction in the risk of death in the United States, except for 1918, when the influenza pandemic occurred. This is a remarkable benefit to people. Prior to the 1960s, it was almost all due to improvements in broad public health, like doctors learning to wash their hands and clean water and all that. But since then, about half of the improvement, as best it can be estimated, is due to um, medical treatment, the kinds of things that uh, IRBs deal with every day, the knowledge base that comes from that and its application. But, as you all know, the benefits have not been equally distributed across the United States. And this is from a key uh, paper by Chris Murray's uh, group, which is now in Seattle, about the eight Americas, uh, divided up by race uh, and sex. And at the lower left-hand corner there, you see African-American men. The upper right-hand uh, line is Asian women, almost a two-decade difference in life expectancy, 20-year difference, people living in the same country. And of course, what any school of public health will teach you is that most of this difference is not due to traditional medical issues. It's due to what has been called the social determinants of health. These used to be almost out of bounds in terms of the kinds of things that medical people would study. But I'm going to show you why now this is totally in bounds and something that we need to adapt to. And I no longer need to talk about this as an issue that pertains to people who don't look like me. This is a startling change that's occurred in our country. And what you see here are middle-aged white men, life uh, mortality rates for economically developed countries. The red line is the United States. You'll notice that people like me are dying at higher rates. We're going in the wrong direction. This is very disturbing because no other economically developed country is seeing the same uh, effect. We are distinctly different, and it's in a crisis state right now. Now, this is Murray's uh, group's latest work, and there are a whole series of papers that have occurred in a variety of medical journals about every disease known to us, and the pictures all essentially look the same. When I show this to non-medical people and say, what is this? They say, well, it's the election map. What it is is a map of life expectancy by county in the United States, where red is not good. Blue is good. And you'll notice that a very large part of our uh, country centered uh, in place, places that I grew up and have lived most of my life are not uh, doing so well. But what's really startling is this slide, which is the trajectory of life expectancy. So this is the direction of life expectancy. And what's happening is that in places where people are already living longer, it's looking better and better. And in places where people are living shorter, it's looking worse and worse. So this is not a stable phenomenon. It's a division in our country, which is occurring for a whole variety of reasons that we need to understand in the context of health and the social determinants of health, where, as, I'll, as I uh, want to keep pointing out, the integration of knowledge within the traditional healthcare delivery system 
and the rest of our culture needs to happen very quickly if we're going to do something about this. Now, the fine print here is not important, but um, as a doctor who's practiced cardiology all my life, you know, you start to wonder, the more you look at data, does anything we do in the healthcare delivery system really matter all that much? There's good news here, and the analysis, it turned out uh, healthcare delivery system actually had a significant effect on uh, longevity in the county by county analysis. Now, it was weaker than physical location, race, uh, sex, um, wealth, and uh, education. Those were the big factors. But healthcare delivery actually did come out in the analysis. So uh, I felt good that doctors and hospitals actually do have a role in the overall picture. Well, if we're going to do something about this, we need an avenue of uh, knowledge uh, that can guide us um, in how we turn this around. And I think we probably all agree that the system that you all have been a key part in developing is a good way to think about things. We start with uh, preclinical studies. We carefully vet most of the things that are tried that don't work. We do early clinical trials with a lot of protection of people who are subjected to unproven treatments. And then we do larger clinical trials to get the answers as to what works. And we incorporate that knowledge then into the body of evidence that we have about treatment. But given what I've shown you, I hope that you will um, agree with me that the current system is simply not adequate for the task. In studies done of how uh, those who are practicing in our healthcare systems feel about research, um, they're not very happy with it. It's seen as burdensome, uh, difficult, taking away from the efficiency of health care. And it was very noticeable to me uh, as FDA commissioner as I went around to academic medical centers how many of our talented young people were saying, this is just not an environment where I feel like research is something I can incorporate into my career at a time when it's so desperately needed and so obvious that it would be beneficial. This is compounded by the fact that the vast majority of recommendations that we make to patients are not currently supported by high quality evidence. Less than 15% of guideline recommendations for our major professional societies are based on high quality evidence. So the majority of what we're recommending to people um, is our best guess without the evidence that we really need. We did this study about a decade ago. It's been updated constantly. This is from the field of cardiology. It's been sort of a bake-off of professional fields, and no one has done better than this. Cardiology is still the best, uh, but that's kind of a pathetic. It's like being at the bottom of the worst uh, league in the country. Um, And if we look at the opioid crisis we currently have, We do need to use the best knowledge that we have, but if you look at the CDC guidelines, the best evidence we have, zero for 13 major recommendations based on high quality evidence. We have to do better. So it's not simply protecting people from research, it's how do we get the research done that's desperately needed so that we can improve the outcomes of our population. And it's not just that people are complaining about it because they feel it, There's good evidence that the system we currently have is economically not sustainable. The price of traditional regulated clinical trials is escalating through the roof. This is a study done by independent economists of the consumer price index of the clinical trials enterprise. It's rising at three times the rate of the biomedical consumer price index, which is rising faster than the general consumer price index. So at a time when we need more evidence, not less, and the information is ubiquitous, and people will gravitate to whatever information they can find on the internet, uh, we have to do something different to improve the system that we're in. Well, the good news is is that the organizational substrate is developing, and I don't have time to go into this in detail, but you're all uh, familiar with the fact that if we just looked back a decade ago and said, who has an electronic health record, it would be almost no one. Now all Americans essentially have an electronic health record. They're not the best. They're hated by practitioners right now. But essentially, there's a digital record of every interaction we have with the health system. I call this my Walmart slide because this is the way 
the dominant businesses in America work today. Every interaction you have with them is recorded digitally. The information is centrally analyzed to understand best, as some people have said, how to separate you from your wallet based on understanding of your behavior and how you think about things, but also how to give you the best consumer experience. And uh, our traditional HMOs figured this out a while ago, but now if you go to any major integrated health system in the U.S., the general scheme pretty much looks the same. You have a group of hospitals, practices, a healthcare system where common data are collected. The information is sent centrally for analysis into a data warehouse. And at least in theory, decision support would come back to help people practice better. Now, we're just early in this uh, state right now. As you all know, the average doctor spends two hours dealing with a computer for every hour with a patient. And there's some startling uh, information I saw two weeks ago. 60% of the time in the clinic, these are films that are done in the clinic, when a doctor asks a patient a question, the doctor is looking at the computer, not uh, at the patient. So we have a ways to go with the technology, but the substrate is there to fix the system. And I would just ask you, in your role of uh, uh, sort of overseeing uh, the research enterprise, what can we do to facilitate the transformation to a system where we're constantly learning and improving the system as a method of doing research? The good news here is that public-private partnerships are developing supported uh, by the federal government. And uh, it was really fun at the FDA to work on this, but now whether it's comparative effectiveness through PCORI or it's uh, drug safety through the Sentinel system, or device outcomes through what's now called the NEST, uh, there are systems that are developing in which integrated health system uh, information can be joined together with proper uh, coordination to really put an end to the days when we had limited sample sizes and inability to ask the questions that needed to be asked. And I think it's a time-limited issue when the information deficit will be the problem. The real issue now is the culture of how we use the information to get the research done as quickly as possible across places which are, frankly, hoarding data at this point in time for a variety of reasons. As an example, um, I, I did have the privilege of working with PCORnet, and when I came out of the FDA, I was pleased to be asked to chair the uh, Patient-Centered Research Foundation, which is a not-for-profit entity that will take PCORnet um, into the, a private not-for-profit for sustainability. But the concept here is that if we um, got a lot of people interested through their patient advocacy groups, and then we join them together with health systems, that we could create a very large network uh, through proper coordination that would have a very large sample size to answer uh, questions more quickly. So this is very much work in progress. The good news is that um, there was an outpouring of interested people and uh, patient research networks from very small rare genetic disease groups to very large diseases like chronic lung disease and heart disease uh, have joined into this effort. And 13 data research networks, including 34 different integrated health systems, are now also part of PCORnet and the PCRF. The great news is uh, the data are becoming less and less of a problem. Once a quarter, we're able to curate the electronic health record data from populations, uh, leading to 122 million people having their data in a form which can be used for research. The problem that we have is linking this to practitioners in the clinic who can obtain consent from people to participate in prospective uh, research and getting uh, the systems to work together to expedite uh, the speed at which the research can be done. The test case is uh, something I had wanted to answer since uh, 1978 when I first uh, became a faculty in cardiology. A hundred years after aspirin is on the market, we still don't know the right dose of aspirin to prevent the next heart attack. Kind of astounding. It's a statement about the deficit in knowledge that we have. 
And so we said, let's just ask a very simple question. Should you get 81 milligrams of baby aspirin or 325 milligrams of full strength aspirin? Through the network, we have something on the order of 3 million people that have uh, documented ischemic heart disease. This is not a sample size problem. Amazingly enough, while I was at FDA, I lost touch with the project. Um, while I was at FDA, this got started. Every single IRB had to go through the consent form and do its own little modifications. It took almost a year to go through the IRBs on this very simple question of what's the right dose of aspirin. Now, during this year, it went through the IRBs. There were millions of Americans whose doctors guessed about the right dose of aspirin, not knowing which is better. Had this been known, uh, thousands of lives could have been saved. Now, the answer may be it doesn't matter, in which case no lives would be saved. The guess would be equally effective, but we just simply don't know today. But the project is off and going. It's really on a roll now. And the idea here, uh, the positive part of this, is that the institutions you know, have worked hard to change their processes so that we can capture data from the electronic health record. We can use uh, electronic systems to identify people and contact them and take advantage of very deep participation of people with a disease of interest in the design, analysis, and dissemination um, of this project. Also, I, something I'm very proud of in terms of uh, federal policy. People ask me a lot today, aren't you glad to be out of the federal government? I hate to admit it, but the answer is actually no. I had a tremendous time at the FDA. I've never worked with people who are so dedicated to their work. Even those terrible common rule meetings that I had to sit through, you know, it wasn't that people weren't trying. It's just, you know, trying to get dozens of federal agencies to agree on anything is just almost impossible. But through it all, in the Cures legislation and the user fee agreements, um, the, the, the law now instructs the FDA to work with you all to come up with systems to use real world evidence so that we can move along the evidence generation system in the United States. So this is something uh, that my FDA colleagues will have to do by law, but I think it should be fun to try to figure this out. How do we change the system from one in which it takes years to answer simple questions to one in which we can take advantage of the fact that everyone has digital information within the health system and it's technically possible to answer all these questions very quickly if we just get organized and culturally um, uh, sort of upfitted uh, to deal with this. And in addition to that, uh, just a little sidelight here, uh, just to uh, spice it up a little bit, it's not just that the breadth of information is possible, the depth of information about every human being is undergoing a revolutionary change now. And here I sort of have the fun of talking about a study in which I'm maximally conflicted because I'm working half-time at Verily, I'm the study sponsor. Um, I'm an institutional official at Duke, which is one enrolling site, and I'm a faculty at Stanford, which is the other enrolling site. So I'm involved in every aspect of this study called Baseline. And the idea here, how many of you uh, have used uh, an automated map while driving in the last two weeks? Almost everybody, and you take it for granted, right? Um, and the way this was done was essentially to map every road in the United States and to keep it up to date. So the question is, if we could do that for every road in the United States, why can't we do that for the human condition? And so the study called Baseline is using all the technology we have at our disposal at Google with the inside of the academic centers um, to try to develop a map of the human condition. This is just a look at the things that are being uh, measured. It's a comprehensive assessment of just about every aspect of biology you can think of, uh, the detailed electronic health record information that we now have, but also importantly, the social information which is now readily available. Everyone in the study not only has the typical biological measurements that you think about, but they go home with a study watch, and just to be fair, I'm wearing my Apple and my Google watch today to, um, to, to point it out, but this study watch measures 17 parameters continuously and can stream the information to the cloud, and they go home with an Android phone, which measures multiple things about them. 
And I'll just point out this one, if you read one uh, article based on this talk, read Tom Ensel's article in JAMA just about a month ago about digital phenotyping. This is going to be revolutionary, and there's a word that I had no idea what it meant until I looked it up, prosody. Does anyone in the audience know what prosody refers to? It, refer, it obviously is derived from prose, and a simple way to think about it is you can tell a lot about a person from the cadence of their voice, from the uh, sort of tone of their voice, and the way they're conducting themselves as they talk. So this is not looking at the actual content of speech, but looking at uh, the way that people talk to infer things about how they're doing. Like you can tell who's depressed, you can tell who has cognitive dysfunction, um, and you can tell um, who's got a purpose in life, actually, from the way that they're conducting themselves on the cell phone. So Tom, who was formerly head of NIMH, I think has a beautiful article because even I could understand it, um, about how your cell phone can be used to infer a lot about you. Each individual has six terabytes of data collected just on the physical visits. And if you think about six terabytes, just storing that information a few years ago would have been a major feat for any university. There's not been a single conversation at Google that I've had about concern about storing the information uh, in the cloud. But now, for uh, put on your seatbelt for what I think is the most important part of this um, talk. We are seeing an erosion in public confidence in uh, veracity of traditional sources of information. So while you're working hard to develop a research system, the public is out there looking up things on the internet, hearing from social media, and questioning what is an expert? Who is it that can tell uh, um, uh, the truth about science? And a key factor is the deluge of information that people are exposed to. In the world that I'm living in, it turns out that there uh, are, I'll just say, more than three billion Google searches done every day. Raise your hand if you've not done a Google search in the last week. Okay. Has anyone, how many of you have done a Google search today already? Okay, so far in the last two months, I've asked probably 10,000 people in medical audiences, 100% of people have done a Google search in the last month. Almost everyone has done at least one search during the day. Turns out that one in 20 uh, searches are health related. And then here are the quotes we're seeing about it. This is from The Economist just this month. Um, there's a lot of concern about what people are seeing when they search the internet for information. And for example, conspiracy theories about vaccinations would be a major uh, source of concern. So the good news is that uh, the tech companies are taking this seriously. The interesting news is no one knows exactly what to do. So I think there's a major role for people like you in helping to figure this out because you're regulating in many ways the way information is generated and the way the information finds its way to pointing out the truth. Here's a look at what people are searching on when it relates to health. And I, I can't give too many details here, but it's interesting that 16% of health-related searches are home remedies. I think of this pretty simply as people trying to figure out how not to have to get involved with you all. They don't want to be involved with a traditional healthcare system if they can avoid it, so they want to find out some approach that they can use at home to avoid having to see you. And little known to most healthcare professionals, we've now gone to a system, um, and I have very little to do with this other than uh, advising it, of knowledge panels. So there is now appearing curated, accurate information based on authoritative knowledge. It's not replacing the search algorithm, but it's appearing in the lower right-hand corner. Or if you use a cell phone, which I'm distressingly learning, most young people don't use laptops at all anymore. They're totally living off their cell phones, uh, it pops up. And it has curated information. But the question I think that's relevant to you at a time when 100% of questions will have an answer on the internet, what is our obligation to speed up research so the answers that are given actually represent truthful evidence of high quality? Right now, it's less than 15%. We have to do better than this. 
So how do, how do we help people find their way to useful action? And I'm just going to give you one example, which is in play right now. The stalking case is uh, suicide and depression. Um, I haven't found anyone yet who believes it's a good idea that if you went on the internet uh, trying to find out how to kill yourself, that it would be a good idea for the internet to give you uh, the best way to kill yourself. And so what pops up now if you do a Google search that indicates you're trying to commit suicide is a link to the nearest hotline uh, for suicide prevention. But then we say, what about depression? 300 million people in the world depressed, 10% of every society. Only about half of people in the world actually get any treatment at all for their depression. And remember this, although it's uh, illegal, uh, according to the rules, to link searches to individuals, so that's not done within the Google environment, um, it's easy to see when someone's depressed because they start searching on things that give you that information. So then you can now look and say, how long is it until they get treated? An average of seven years after people begin to indicate that they're depressed until they get initial treatment. And treatment uh, is effective thanks to the research that's been done. It's not completely effective and it's only incremental, but cognitive behavioral therapy and medications can have an impact. And so now, um, Given the fact that um, probably about half the world is doing a Google search every day, and when people are depressed, they start to look, the question is, what's the social responsibility to try to do something about it, and how can you do something about it? So the first step uh, has been taken, which is, uh, if you're searching on depression, the question will come up, would you like to take a questionnaire? And the questionnaire is a PHQ-9, which is a vetted, uh, validated questionnaire used in medical screening. And um, I can't, it, this is only about two months old, but you can imagine with the number of searches how many people have already filled out this questionnaire. And I'll just tell you that the completion rate of those who start the questionnaire is amazingly high, and you'll hear more about this later. But this begins to make you think, how do we scale research so that we get answers quickly in a helpful way to all these people that are searching? So I'll close with just a couple of slides about where I hope uh, we'll go and where I hope you'll help guide us. I think we need a massive educational shift to take advantage of this gift of technology and optimize it. We need our data scientists to curate and make data better at a faster rate. Otherwise, people will be getting bad information uh, and will have no way to counter it with good information. We need to share. And if there's one thing I would emphasize to you all, please help us figure out how to share information. If your child had a rare genetic disease today, the thing you would want more than almost anything else is for everyone else with rare gen that rare genetic disease to share their information for the best scientists in the world to do the work needed to find a cure for that disease. And then finally, uh, here's a scheme of the way Google search uh, works. Um, basically, everything that you do when you do a Google search is connected to everything else. So, and it's constantly being analyzed to understand better how to make the searches more useful to you. But what's really amazing to me, which I learned a few years ago, is that when there's a question about what to do with a search engine, you have to submit a protocol and something called an A-B comparison is done, which is simply a pragmatic randomized trial. And the point here is that in the business world, when it's important to the business and you don't know the answer, you do a randomized trial to get the answer as quickly as possible. Now, Google has the advantage that five to 10 million people may um, enter the randomized trial in the first hour. But that advantage comes because of the scalability of the technology, which is readily adaptable to healthcare at the same time. But you might wonder why it is that in business, randomization has now become the dominant mode of finding the answers to tough questions, whereas in medicine, we guess most of the time about what we're doing. And when we do a randomized trial, it's considered a very special set-aside sort of a thing. And then this is the last slide. Um, and it, I think it raises a number of questions. This is a slide someone gave me while I was at the FDA about where computing is heading. And uh, in 2010, you'd say computing was based on optimizing the functionality of the individual. So uh, office would be a good example of that. 
In 2020, the goal is collective intelligence. That is, given a common body of information, if multiple people are working on that knowledge base at the same time, the speed at which uh, the truth is found or knowledge is gained uh, is much more rapid. But this calls into play a very different approach um, to the way that we deal with the world of information that we're dealing with. So um, I appreciate your listening. Hopefully this has given you a few things to think about in addition to uh, the, the, the routine part of the meeting. Well, thank you, Rob. That was really interesting. We have a few minutes for questions if people want to come to the microphones. And let me just kick it off, Rob, by asking you a question. You mentioned that you thought the revisions to the common rule were totally inadequate to address some of the issues that you saw most pressing that needed to be um, uh, taken on through more human subjects research. Just specifically, what revisions would you like to have seen? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't think I should be totally it, it's so, okay. it's so uh, profound, but I think the biggest issue is how do we create an environment where information flows freely like it does in other aspects of life? It's as if you've got 1% of things happening in a clinic and a hospital. That's very protected. The biggest determinants of how long you live and your functionality with illnesses you might prevent or have is the other 99%. That information is pretty available right now. It's available to advertisers who want to influence you. We need to open up that 1% in some way that allows for the sharing of information so we can put it to use to prevent and treat illness. And there's just no way the common rule, given all the complexity, was going to be able to deal with that. OK, thank you. All right, yes. I'd, I'd like to ask you, what do you think is the proper role of the research community to respond to the ever-increasing deaths in the United States due to gun violence? Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for asking that question, and it's, uh, it's a tough one. What, what uh, you'll notice I have here uh, on number nine, I'm just leaving this up here, consequences of not doing research. I think people who think about the ethics of research, you, you know, there was, this is just my personal view, there was a reason things went the way they did. We had some atrocious approaches to research that were, was, were, was done. We uh, believe that there was an ethic of doctors' uh, fiduciary relationship with patients. And so we separated the two. And we said, we got to protect uh, per, uh, subjects from research uh, malfeasance. I think right now the biggest issue is what is the consequence, what is the ethical responsibility when research is not done? So the fact that there are laws that prevent gun violence from being a subject of research in certain federal agencies is quite astounding. There was a bill introduced in Congress a month ago, a provision that would have made it illegal to use geospatial mapping to point out disparities uh, in the United States. So not doing research, I think, uh, is, is uh, quite dangerous. So how do we know what to do about gun violence if we're not studying it? So I think the community needs to speak out, not to give a preaching sort of thing about here's the solution, but we won't know the solution unless we do the research. Thank you. All right, Ben. Yeah. Uh, ben Wolf on Seattle. Thank you very much for your uh, very thoughtful talk. W Clearly, you made the case for why research is important. And I want to mention that one of the issues that's come up, I've heard over the last day and a half, has been the question about nudging. And how, do, and how do we think about how we frame information we give to people that either pushes them closer or farther away from joining a research project? So I'd be interested in your thoughts about how, what, what, what did you think we ought to do in terms of using these concepts of behavioral economics to either push people in one direction or the other for participation? That was, ben, that was sort of a leading question, I know. But uh, yeah, so I, I'm an unabashed uh, believer in research. I guess that's obvious. And I think since people who participate in research certainly don't do worse than those who don't. Jeremy and I were just uh, quipping um, a little bit earlier this morning. and. 
you know, protecting people in research is good, but I think the people, if you look at the data, the people that need the most uh, protection right now are those not participating in research. So I think we need to nudge people to participate. Then we have a big responsibility to do it right. Uh, that's, that's the second part of it. But I think the business uh, that I see in so many health systems in the U.S. today, advertising, people talk about pharma advertising. Have you gone in a big city and looked at the advertisements from our leading academic medical centers? They're not based on evidence. What we ought to be doing is encouraging people to participate in research to get the answers so their treatment uh, will be the right treatment for them. Yes. Uh, thanks, Rob. John Lantos, Kansas City. Question about uh, informed consent. When you look at uh, companies like Google tweaking their algorithms, they're doing randomized trials. And when they published those once, people complained that they were doing research without consent. But it turns out we do consent. We just consent through those things where it says, have you read this 30-page form? And we all click the box that says yes. And the form says we can do research. Would that sort of form be adequate, do you think, <laughs> for a learning healthcare system? Uh, no. And this is my opinion. Um, uh, let me just point out, and I'll give Scott Zeger credit for this at Hopkins, who in a meeting uh, last year pointed out to me, he said, you know, if someone wants to do research to help you live a life which is detrimental to your health, they do it every day. It's called targeted advertising. And they use randomized trials, and they use very detailed uh, analytics of all kinds of things about you. You know, putting it to myself, I love Bojangles biscuits. So when I see an advertisement for Bojangles, it goes right to the uh, part of the brain which uh, overrules the cortex. But if you want to help someone, then you've got to go through an IRB and you've got to do all this other stuff. It's like you're trying to help people with your hand tied behind your back. I think the useful intermediaries here have to be the uh, integrated health systems, which need to play an intermediary role to help people understand that um, research is good. You should uh, get the nudge towards participation. Um, and, and we're going to uh, participate with you, not just as a passive subject, but as a participant uh, in the system. And then I think people need to get into the habit of just getting A-B comparisons done so they get the right medical care. Easy to say that. I know it's a lot harder to do it. All right. We'll take maybe a few more questions. If Five more minutes, sure. Rob? Okay. Sure. Please, Robert. Robert Klitzman from Columbia University. Thank you very much for a great talk. I agree with you completely that information that we obtain through Google and social media is crucial and sharing that information is crucial. But I'm wondering if there are concerns or tensions that come up because Google is a privately held company. Uh, and many social media companies, for instance, have even refused to give information to Congress regarding Russian interference. That's been an issue. And just in terms of that tension of how available Google's data is to researchers out there, et cetera, I'm wondering about your comments. Sure. Uh, I mean, there's a reason that I'm uh, living a bi-coastal life. I felt like um, so much of the power of what I've described is in Silicon Valley, um, and it is in private companies. Um, but the problems are in places like North Carolina, and the intermediary, I think, needs to be universities and integrated health systems. Um, there is a tension, and I don't think anyone knows the right set point. That's why we need people like you to be very involved. And, you know, I would argue universities, by and large, have been asleep at the wheel in this regard. If there's one thing I think universities ought to be focused in on right now, it's how to deal with this information issue. Even all the bright red counties that I showed all have state universities that have some accountability that the biggest employers and should be the, uh, the, the uh, intermediaries. So um, I, I think there are definitely uh, these issues of tension. I would point out there's a lot more information about Google search, for example, available on the internet than people realize, but not all of it. And um, it is complicated because people do want their privacy protected. So. Um, I think it's, a, it's just a hot topic that we need to work on. So if I could follow up, if a university researcher wanted to access Google information that's not currently available, would Google release that? Uh, it depends on what the person wanted. So, and, and you know, far be it from me to 
I'm used to, when I was FDA commissioner, I said, I, you know, I can't speak for the whole federal government. Google is a pretty big organization. I'm just an advisor. But, you know, there are ways to access uh, information, and I'm not going to pretend that it's necessarily easy. But I do think as a group, we, uh, you know, as a, as a country, we need to work on this. And I think uh, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi, Doug McFarland, uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, given what you said about uh, prosody, I think, that was a new one for me and really interesting. But given the amount of information that can be inferred through uh, data that's certainly not protected health information, uh, is the very concept of PHI now outdated? Well, so you asked about the company. So, I mean, this is way out on a limb. Um, you can probably guess from my presentation that I think it is outdated. I mean, if the main determinants of your health are not what happens in a clinic or a hospital, and all that information is available to somebody um, without the PHI HIPAA type protections, then it seems to me that we have an outdated system. Now, you know, what the, what the right system is, I think, is a matter of discourse. And I wish there, you know, so if you ask me the common rule, it shouldn't be updated every 15 years. It should be a constant ongoing, and this time of a revolution of information, it should be an ongoing updated thing where we all work together to try to, try to find the right set point in these issues. Again, easy to say. Right. I think a lot of other people agree with you, but yeah, if only it were that easy. Yes. Hi, I'm Cheryl Garropy from Columbus, Ohio. I'm a pediatric specialist, and I have patients who drive five hours from that deep red part of West Virginia and Kentucky to see me. And as you're talking, I'm really concerned that your approaches, talking about my patients who come are like lucky to have a car that drives that far. They don't necessarily have internet access. Um, and I'm concerned that we're not going to be gathering data on the people whose health is really the worst and going down quick, and we're not going to be able to get the information to them, or they won't have health care providers near them to be able to deliver the things that we discover. You're, um, I share your concern. I, I will say that in general, in general, cell phone use uh, doesn't have a digital divide where there is an enormous and growing digital divide is the uh, use and interpretation of the information that's there. So bear with me for one second here. Um, if you look at what's on our uh, cell phones today, it's more information about health than the best researchers had five or ten years ago uh, in their computing environments. Uh, highly intelligent, ele educated, and wealthy people are accessing that information and using it to live longer. That's what's happening in the blue counties. And you can see it if you look at the publicly available search records. In the blue counties, it's 401ks, um, exercise uh, outfits and equipment, and gifts for relatives. In the red counties, an entirely different group of things are being searched on. So, uh, I, so as I, I'll just repeat it again, um, in those Appalachian areas, and I, it's one reason I went back to North Carolina, it's my origin, um, I think we have, a, the, there are universities there that are quite good, and I think we have to reorient it to create some kind of a different social, economic structure than we currently have. Again, easy to say, but I hope we'll all work together on it. Well. Please join uh, me in thanking Rob for his thoughtful address today. Thank you so much.